The SRDS, or Smoke Round Deployment System, consists of three components, a reloadable fuse, a reusable delivery shell, and a disposable smoke round. Upon spoon release, the fuse ignites, triggering a user-selected delay before the smoke round is ejected from the shell. Each round can deploy either a non-toxic rapid screening smoke or a high-volume colored smoke. The intro showcased a high-volume colored round. The screening round, aided by its lightweight design and a helical igniter at its core, rapidly ejects a thick white cloud. The smoke plume's thrust spins the round, randomly dispersing the smoke screen over a wide area in minimal time. After the fuse delay, the screening round jumps to a maximum output instantly and disperses all of its smoke in 15 to 20 seconds. The colored smoke round, in contrast, produces a steady, high volume output lasting 40 to 60 seconds. Like everything on this channel, it's homemade because you can't buy this shit anywhere. I designed this system to reduce the labor and cost per round. Each disposable round costs about four bucks and has a yield factor that is at least 130% higher than the military's M83. Proof of that bold claim can be found in the beginning of this video. We will start with a reusable shell. The threading on an M228 fuse is 5 8 by 11. The threading on an M201A1 fuse is 9 16 by 12. These are the correct threadings. Anything else you read or hear on the internet that says otherwise is wrong. If you ask AI, it will give you the wrong answer. Ask me how I know. You can buy the nuts to fit this threading at hardware stores like Ace, Home Depot, or Lowe's. We will be setting these nuts in epoxy at the top of our shell. Using a can opener in the vertical orientation, we remove the bottom of the Tiki Torch can. Next, we've got to abrade the nut. I use a hacksaw or a right angle grinder to cut slots on the corners of the nut to increase strength by allowing the epoxy to key the nut. A key in this case is a mechanical bond formed when the epoxy fills or grips surface irregularities ensuring the epoxy sticks securely without slipping or delaminating. We hot glue the nut and the canister to a silicone baking mat to contain the epoxy. Make sure it is centered. Then we pour the epoxy and allow it to cure. Drilling and tapping a solid epoxy lid is an option, however it is not as durable and can be easily destroyed if knocked on a rock or if it's cross thread a couple times. Once cured, clean off hot glue. I personally like to add quarter inch metal hardware cloth to add a reinforcement in cases where the fuse strikes a rock when thrown. That is not necessary, and it is a pain in the ass. Fill irregularities and spray paint desired color. High temp paint is not required. The smoke round. The procedure for the colored and screening rounds is the same, however they use different compositions all of which can be found in the free PDF section of my website. If you want to purchase all the chemicals for both screening and colored smokes in one place, find my kit at Fireworks Cookbook. Find or make a cylinder that fits snugly inside the Tiki Torch canister. If ordering 2.5 inch internal diameter mailing tubes, ensure they're thick enough to handle the high pressure of the screening smoke rounds. Thin tubes from Amazon, aka the Oriental Trading Company, may burst into fireballs. Ask me how I know. All right, this is a TPA formula, uh, the typical TPA formula that I use. But However, it has cellulose acetate as a binder. 
and I just wanted to test that out. This is the SRDS. It'll eject from that canister. <laughs> spin around. Ooh. Oh, and burst into fucking flames, dude. That's a no-go. These Amazon tubes are, however, safe for colored rounds due to their lower pressure. For stronger cylinders, make your own using Staples 3-inch mailing tubes, which are more durable, though a rip-off, like everything at Staples. To craft your own, overlap the tube, insert it into the canister, expand until snug, mark a line, remove, and glue with thin and thick CA glue, using an activator for quick setting. Alternatively, use the canister as a jig to hold the tube in place while the glue sets. Once tubes are cut to size, we will make an epoxy base. First, we use a hot glue gun to glue the rim of the tube to a silicone baking mat. This is to create a barrier to retain the epoxy to make the base. For the screening rounds, I prefer to drill holes along the bottom edges to allow the epoxy to key to increase strength. Drill from the inside of the tube outward to avoid delamination of the cardboard. We cut a disc of quarter-inch metal hardware cloth and toss it in the epoxy base. We can kind of push the epoxy up the sides of the container to maximize bonding area. Once cured, we add the smoke mix. Make sure that all ingredients are a fine powder and intimately mixed. We add in layers, compressing as we go, ideally with a press. We want to compress it until it's solid. I compress mine to about a thousand pounds because that's the capacity of my press. Stop at three quarters of an inch from the top of the cylinder. Next, we cap off the top with a 3 8 inch layer of epoxy with a matrix. Before we mix and pour the epoxy, we cut a quarter inch hardware cloth donut and four strips, which are two squares wide and one and a half inches long. Now we clean the inside edges of the tube before pouring the epoxy over the composition. We place the donut matrix into the epoxy, then embed those four strips as seen here. These are used to hold the silicone valve in place. Once that cures, we will drill out the center core with a 5 8 inch or 3 quarter inch bit. Now that we have an open core, we install the helical igniter. This igniter consists of a roll of quarter inch hardware cloth and the fastest viscofuse you can get your hands on. We weave a figure 8 as seen and apply a primer to the fuse sections that are in contact with the inner wall of the composition. I use the same primer formula found in the military's M18 and M83. That is shown here. Many other alternatives will work. I have a free PDF of primer formulas on my website. Once that is dry, we shove the helical igniter down the core and place a small amount of painter's tape to protect the fuse from the silicone we are about to apply. Squirt some Type 1 silicone into a mixing cup. It must be Type 1. Add a few drops of glycerin and a few drops of water and mix. If you don't have glycerin, cornstarch will work. Mix a half tablespoon of cornstarch and a few drops of water, then mix that slurry into the silicone. Type 1 silicone cures using moisture. Typically, silicone absorbs moisture from the air. However, water absorbed from the atmosphere will only penetrate approximately one quarter inch into silicone, and it cures at a rate of three millimeters per day, which is too slow. By using glycerin or cornstarch, we force water into the silicone and cure that shit fast. Both of these agents are aggressive water donors. It also allows us to rapidly cure whatever thickness we want. Down with the thickness. Oh, ah, ah, ah. We spread that into the remaining void of the tube like a fluffernutter with so much fluff it makes you nauseous. Once that cures, we cut a cross between the metal hardware cloth strips. We loop the fuse around itself to make an X, then coat that with a primer. Good job! The fuse. I apologize for the pitter-patter if you can hear it. It's pouring. 
I had a whole section here of complicated steps, and I'm trying to be an earthling and understand that not everybody is an overstimulated, autistic, grown-ass man living in a box truck full of tools, isolated from society, who tinkers constantly to avoid being an adult. In fact, the thought of adding any more information to this video is making me nauseous, and I apologize for the complexity. The reality is, this is extremely tedious work, but these devices cannot be bought, and it's really amazing that we are still able to legally make these devices in America, for now. I've done a few things to make this overall process easier. First, I've come up with a kit that includes everything necessary to complete the fuse assembly, which minimizes your work and supports my channel, aka my life. Second, I made two white label partnerships. The first is with Fireworks Cookbook. They have compiled all the necessary chemicals at my request. Go to fireworkscookbook.com and search for Invention Incarnate. The second arrangement is with pyrocreations.com and this includes all the fuses that are required for my videos. Description links are not allowed by the contacts that control this platform. Go to pyrocreations.com and search for my name. With that being said, here's the video that covers the fuse rearming process. I will link it at the end of this video. It will be an end card. It covers both my kit instructions and what you need to know to do this on your own without my kit. I will show how to reload the fuse with igniters from that kit right now. The way it works is you just slide it in, pull down, add a little tension, a little bit of tension on the fuse and you just, just to hold it flush on the strike plate, and then you just tighten it with this Allen screw, or the, the hex key. Don't over tighten it because you don't want to compress the powdered core, but that'll hold it in place. Yeah, and then you just put the spoon on and rearm it. Also, a few tips. First, retain the spoon either by spray painting it bright orange or by securing with a cord. If you are securing with a cord, drill a hole here in the center of the fuse head and glue using JB Weld. I have found that other glues do not work very well at all and unfortunately my favorite glue, CA glue, is too brittle. Be sure to scratch painted surfaces down to bare metal before adhesion. Another hot tip, use a pair of needle nose pliers to nip the striker, creating a rougher strike surface. These things are old, sometimes dirty, and they've flattened a bit from their original use. Last hot tip, cut the standoff off from the bottom of the M228s for use when directly mounted to a canister. I use a hacksaw and then I deburr with a file. An observation that I've made is that the M228 spoons seem to impede less on striker arm path when compared to the M201A1 spoons. I suspect it is because this spoon has more acute of an angle and more force is recruited from the swing path to eject the spoon. Also, the M228 has less rotational torque due to the shorter relative distance between the fulcrum and the end of the spoon. What that really means is that I, you'll have a higher success rate using M228 spoons than you will using the M201A1 spoons. Like, subscribe, click notifications, go to my website and get my free info and buy my kits. Okay, goodbye, I love you.